Namaste. So I'm sorry about leaving everybody hanging last time, but you know, we got 15 minutes, right? So I ran out of time. I got a down vote and a nasty comment from one of our faithful viewers. <laughs> if only my friends would be as faithful as my enemies, you know, I'd have it made. <laughs> anyway, this person thinks that they are a bhakta. And they're like, well, without regulative principles, how can you have bhakti, right? Because if you read my Adi Guru's books, they're nothing but regulative principles, regulative pr principles, and he just beats you up with his regular, regulable principles. But actually, that's not bhakti. That is karma yoga. Let's be clear. And because these terms are misdefined, people are not getting the result. What is the result of karma? You become qualified, adhikara, to advance further into bhakti. Now, as I said yesterday, the last time, bhakti cannot be regulated. Bhakti is love. Love is spontaneous. You can't regulate it, legislate it, manage it. <laughs> In fact, it's completely internal and has no external symptoms whatsoever unless it spills over into ecstasy. And then you get the ecstatic symptoms and so forth. But you can't get that with regulative principles. You can only get that through authentic bhakti. Now, I'm going to, you know, Instead of hitting people over the head with the regulative principles, I'm going to hit people over the head with spontaneous bhakti because in the uh, most authoritative book on bhakti, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu by Srila Rupa Goswami, his elder brother Sanatan Goswami writes in the introduction that, you ready for this? Spontaneous love has no regulative principles. No regulative principles. Period. So there's not much wiggle room there. If you're following rules and regs, and if you are involved in uh, rituals, rites, routines, you know, uh, a daily schedule and stuff like that. That's not bhakti. That's not bhakti. That may help to create a foundation and a karmic base for bhakti. But bhakti itself is completely internal. It's of the heart. Huh? When you internalize those principles and that seva, the service to God. And it comes issuing out in spontaneous love and uh, spontaneous service, not scheduled, not regulated, not managed, not ordered, hmm? but uh, just purely spontaneous based on love alone. Uh -huh. Love has no basis. It has no rules. Uh, the gopis are famous for their lawless love of Krishna. Means they followed no regulative principles. They just did what their heart desired. That's bhakti. Okay? So if you want to talk about advanced bhakti, you know, and regulative bhakti, regulative bhakti is karma yoga. Let's get it right. Real bhakti is beyond all regulative principles. You know, you don't find real bhaktas going around building temples. You know, that's, that's for neophytes. That's also stated in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Why don't these people read their own books? I don't get it. Anyway, so today I want to talk about Raja Yoga and Jnana Yoga. Now, Raja Yoga is similar... Well, actually, it is 
the basis of Buddha's teaching. The kings in the old days were taught this type of yoga. That's why it's called Raja Yoga for kings. And the, the idea of Raja Yoga is nothing is real. So the self isn't real. The world isn't real. Phenomena aren't real. Objects aren't real. Thoughts, dreams, concepts, words, none of it is real. Huh? All form melts into emptiness. So this is the principle of Raja Yoga. So all the forms and names and phenomena that are so carefully built up in karma and bhakti yoga are dissolved in Raja Yoga. There's a story about Paramahansa, no, not, not Yogananda, um, Ramakrishna Paramahansa. Ramakrishna Paramahansa worshipped Mother Kali his whole life. And he could go into ecstasy just thinking of her. And so toward the end of his life, he was a little concerned that, well, I haven't realized a formless Brahman. So uh, I forget the name of the sadhu. The sadhu came along and said, no, you must dissolve this form. You must get beyond form to formlessness. Then only you will realize the Brahman. So Ramakrishna tried and tried, and he just couldn't get beyond this form of Mother Kali. So finally, the yogi said, look, let's try one more time. I don't have a lot of time to waste here. You go into meditation, you go into samadhi, and when you see the form of Mother Kali, you give me a sign, and I will press a piece of broken glass into your third eye. And at that point in your meditation, you have to pick up a sword and uh, cut this form in pieces. So that's what happened. And when Ramakrishna uh, cut to pieces his deity, Mother Kali, then the Brahman manifested from within her and he was able to realize the formless at last. So um, Raja Yoga, this is the third category of sadhana in the classic books. I'm not going to go into, you know, anything outside the scope of the Vedas because really the Vedas contain everything and um, other religions just kind of reflect various aspects of the Vedas. So Vedas give both preliminary and advanced instructions. In the preliminary instruction, they say, do this puja, recite this name, huh? do this kind of worship, do that kind of meditation, and so on. And then finally, you reach the spontaneous stage where you realize it for yourself. And then there's no more need for instruction. It happens all by itself. So when that happens, then you get the result, which, of course, is bliss, right? And uh, even you can get beyond bliss. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, first of all, you, you have to get to the bliss. And how do you do that? By internalizing the principles, the regulative principles of whatever sadhana you're doing. Now, you can't do Raja Yoga unless you are a mature karma yogi and bhakti yogi. You can't do it. You'll fall down. Your mind will go running off, jumping all over the universe like a monkey. <laughs> you won't be able to concentrate and so on. I, I did one video called Jump Up, Fall Down. And this is what happens. People attempt forms of meditation they're not qualified to do. They haven't taken the time to build a foundation. And so they fail, basically. And this is very discouraging for their future spiritual life. So I advise strongly against it. Start at the beginning. Do it right. And of course, you did watch the Introduction to the Esoteric Teaching series, right? <laughs> Which gives the background for this discussion. 
Uh, I linked to it in the description of one of the videos. So in Raja Yoga, you come to realize emptiness, nothingness, silence. And out of that silence and stillness, Brahman manifests spontaneously. Here we go again, right? It's the silence, the stillness is something you have to attain by destroying all mental concepts. And out of that, the Brahman comes automatically. Then we shift into Jnana. Jnana Yoga. Jnana means knowledge. It's usually translated knowledge, rather. It doesn't really mean knowledge in the ordinary sense. Because ordinary knowledge is made of words, forms, concepts, and like that. But jnana is beyond all concepts. It's beyond the mind completely. See, Raja Yoga is to get rid of the mind. And then jnana yoga is pure awareness. Now, the difference between pure awareness and consciousness is that consciousness requires duality, subject-object, duality, whereas pure awareness has no subject-object duality. It's very difficult to understand. In fact, it's impossible to understand because the mind is based on duality. So you, you just have to get qualified for it and experience it. And this experience is called grace, the grace of God, which passeth all understanding. Huh? So that grace of God means God manifests within you fully. Ramana Maharshi once was asked, well, what's the difference between an avatar and a jnani? And his reply was, an avatar is an incarnation of one aspect of God. But a jnani is simply God, identical. No difference. No partial incarnation. Uh, all incarnations are partial incarnations. None of them manifest the full opulence of the Supreme. But a jnani does. A jnani doesn't deny anything. See, in all these other yogas, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, you have to deny certain aspects of the reality. You have to suppress certain desires and certain actions and so on like that, according to the particular discipline. But in jnana yoga, from the very start, there are no rules, no regulations. Nothing is denied. Everything is accepted. Why? Because the jnana yogi sees the world is perfect. See, all, all the other yogins complain that, <coughs> excuse me, God is perfect. So how has he created this imperfect world? Well, the imperfection is not in the world <laughs> or in God. The imperfection is in your view because you're biased. See, you're trying to uh, superimpose a certain view on reality instead of just being content with reality itself. So in this way, you uh, mistake the actual nature of God. God is not partial. God is not biased. God is not uh, imperfect in any way. So the jnani realizes this and realizes that everything is perfect just the way it is. The jnani sees the whole universe. You got to trust me on this. Sees the whole universe emanating like a blazing fire from Brahman. And just like a blazing fire has thousands and thousands of little sparks. So the individual beings are like sparks in this fire. Huh? And the farther away the sparks get 
from the uh, core of the blaze, the cooler they get. And the cooler they get, the more they get covered by ignorance. Okay? Actually, fire can never be covered by darkness, can never be co covered by ignorance. Okay? But in the... This is so hard to explain. In the world of phenomena, you always have a source. And that source then uh, dissipates in some kind of medium. And this is what we experience as reality or the world or phenomena. So the jnani is aware of both the source and the phenomena, not through consciousness, but directly by being it. Just like, let's say you're in a dark room, you can't see anything, but you still know that you have hands and feet because you can feel them from the inside, isn't it? Maybe you can't see your hands, but you know you, that you have hands. In the same way, the jnani does not use consciousness to perceive the world because he is the world. <laughs> this is so hard to explain. It's impossible, actually. You have to experience it for yourself, and then you'll re get the reality. Okay, so next time, <laughs> here we go again. Next time I'm going to try to... Um, wrap this all up and show how it is a uh, uh, natural expression of the esoteric teaching. And then uh, we'll get into the truth about the truth about the truth. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung.